tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Before we get started with everything, I wanted to make sure that you aren't missing out on all of the dastardly delights that we have to offer. Scary Stories Told in the Dark is but one of the many shows that you could be listening to. Don't miss the upcoming episode of Fear from the Heartland, featuring Paul J. McSorry, airing Wednesday evenings. And of course, don't miss the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast, nor Horror Hill, starring Eric Peabody, or Drew Blood's Dark Tales. You can find them all at simplyscarypodcast.com or your favorite podcast provider. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights. If you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2023, why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for your phone bill? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year, as the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton, with phone plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. The year's moving right along. Though, with all the winter storms lately, it may just feel like it's still January. With that in mind, don't just leave your savings plan behind. With Mint Mobile, you can leave behind all the baggage from your previous wireless service. No need to trudge through the snow to find new prices and new plans. With an online-only model that delivers your plan right to your door, Mint Mobile is passing the savings along and the convenience to you. Keep your phone, and within a few minutes, with eSIM, you'll be on Mint Mobile's network. And considering that every plan you can get starts with unlimited talk and text, with high-speed data on the largest 5G network in the country, you'll already be ahead than most of the other guys and at prices they simply can't beat. And in times when every penny counts, I want you, dear listener, getting the best deals you can possibly get. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. Ha 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 ha! Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 12, Episode 16. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author James Colton. Tonight, we'll hear stories of strange storms, love undying, familial regrets, Repugnant Reflections. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the dare, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. 
Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Ever woken up in the night because a storm got your attention? Not to worry, it happens from time to time. And usually you can just go right back to sleep and ignore the lightning illuminating that figure standing in the hallway. But for the story we're about to hear, some storms are much more peculiar and carry a far different weight. Almost like the world is trying to tell us something. Without further ado, I present to you, Memoriam Eterna. The storm of the morning of December 26th was predicted by no meteorologist. We had no time to prepare. In the still dark hours, I woke to the ghostly light of moon and stars reflected off snow. The radio, left on overnight to serenade us with lingering Christmas carols, now played only static. It was frigid in the house. Outside, nearly a foot of snow had fallen. I ventured out to the barn to check on the cows. My boots crunched through the thin layer of ice that kept the powder beneath from stirring. Although it seemed the storm's fury had long passed, and not a breath stirred the air. The barn doors cracked and groaned as I opened them. Snowdrifts blocked the way, and the woodwinds frosted over. By the time I forced my way inside, the cold had infiltrated my heavy clothing and begun stinging my skin. The barn was empty, no cows, not even the frozen corpses I'd feared to discover. I left the barn and gazed out across the blank distance. Virgin snow glowed, save for the dark, wavering trail of my footprints. Nothing else marred the expanse. Not a trace of hoof or boot aside from my own. They must have fled before the storm. Sensed it was coming and broken out of their stalls, and the snow covered their trail. It was the only explanation I could think of. How would I find them? I couldn't search on foot, and although my truck could probably handle the roads, I doubted it would get me far in the fields. The cows wouldn't have stayed in the fields anyway. They'd have sought the shelter of the woods where my truck definitely wouldn't go. With nothing else to be done, I returned to the house. It was still dark. Not even a paling of the eastern sky to betray the rising sun. The radio still filled the house's hollow spaces with static. I left it on, hoping the signal would eventually clear up and bring us word of how the storm had impacted the rest of the world. The others were still asleep. The lights didn't work. I tried the kitchen first, then the living room. Nothing. Yet the radio continued to play. Its static followed me from room to room like a muttering shadow. Now and then I caught hints of garbled words spoken in a low, calm, and level voice. And Shua set well stones in idst of Jordan in the block. That was impossible. The radio ran off the same circuit as the kitchen lights, unless all the bulbs had blown during the storm. I checked some of the other electronics. The digital clocks seemed to work. That is, their displays all flashed at me, all showing the same time. 6.33, never changing, no matter how long I watched them. The radio and the clocks, nothing else seemed to have power. Not even the electric stove. This alarmed me at first, then I realized I wasn't hungry. When the time came, I could light a fireplace and cook over open flame. The refrigerator was dead, but we could move all the perishables outside to keep them cool. Phones were out too, both landline and cell. There was no way of reaching the outside world except going out into it ourselves. The plows hadn't hit our road yet, but as I'd noted earlier, my truck could probably make it through. I had to try. Announcing my departure in case any of the others could hear me, I set out once more through the cold to my vehicle. 
The engine didn't respond when I turned the key. The dashboard didn't even light up, so the battery was dead as well. The thought of diagnosing and fixing the problem in the bitter cold was unappealing to say the least, so I sat behind the steering wheel and debated my next course of action. Beyond the windshield stretches an endless white field. I could see my trail between the house and the barn and my more recent trail from the house to the truck. But aside from that, purity. So smooth, it seemed like polished marble. So bright, it blurred my vision. I averted my gaze upward toward the black sky and caught my breath. Stars. No wonder the snow was so luminous. Pinpricks of cold brilliance like holes poked in a black veil allowing some overwhelming power to shine through. They were sharp and far too close. Their thousand-pointed gazes seemed to be directed at me, pressing against the windshield, threatening to pierce the glass with their keen light. It hurt my eyes, not like the burning ache of looking into the sun, but the pain of razors held against skin. I had to get away from it. I left the truck and hurried back to the house, slamming the door against the ethereal landscape and the alien stars. Now I was alone with the blinking clocks and hissing radio. Alone, but not for long. I could hear the others stirring. The singing sigh of my wife, the gentle pattering feet of my children. In case they wanted breakfast, I went about lighting the fireplace. Then I went to the kitchen for some eggs. The refrigerator, like the barn, was empty. I shut the door and opened it again. Not possible. Unless, unless my wife had woken during the night during the storm and preemptively moved all the food. I started to call for her, but then noticed the house was quiet again. The radio static was gone. Silence pressed against my mouth and held it shut. I crept from the kitchen toward the bedrooms. I stopped at the mast at first. The bed was vacant. I checked the kids' rooms next. Their beds were neatly made, but empty, like the barn and the refrigerator. But I heard them running around. They had to be here somewhere. I finally managed to open my mouth and call out. The response was distant, but not what I expected. A low hum, like the dying echo of a large bell, rumbled through the air. Pulsed, rising in volume and depth, fading again, returning even louder than before. My knees shook, and soon I was on the floor. I tried to crawl, but my limbs felt so heavy, numb. I lay there until the humming faded away completely. As it did, the radio slowly crackled again, and the feeling spread through me. I found my feet and stood there, sweating. After several minutes, the rapid thump of small feet reached my ears from the direction of the living room. A woman singing softly started walking in that direction. My path took me by the radio and I paused. Beneath the static, a matter-of-fact voice was speaking. Ill the suspect, subsequent search of house reveal. A news story, but nothing about the storm. I came to the living room and stopped at the threshold. The room was just as my wife kept it, clean and tidy, but empty. No children running about, no mother watching over them. Just a vacant room highlighted in the cold light of the stars through the window. What time was it? The clocks couldn't be right. Still no sign of morning on the horizon. Then something caught my eye, something in the field outside. I hurried to the window for a better look. In the center of the vast blankness of undisturbed snow, something stood. Something short, dark, and misshapen. It hadn't been there during my treks to the barn and the truck. I knew this because my footprints passed directly through it. I waited for it to move, holding my breath so as to not fog up the glass. The thing remained motionless. What was it? Curiosity. No, something stronger. The primal need to solve the problem drove all else from my mind as I ran outside. I didn't even bother to throw on my coat. 
I plowed through the snow and stopped, breathless, before what I now saw was a pile of stones. Nothing more sinister than that. I laid my bare hand against the rock, felt its rigid, rough surface. Nothing so unusual except for the mystery of its appearance. I scanned the ground in the immediate area, confirming what I'd observed from the living room window. Aside from my own footprints, nothing disturbed the snow. No other tracks merged with my own. Whoever had set up these stones must have used my trail from earlier. My eye was drawn upward toward the stars, just before they glared down at me. Never before had I seen stars such as these. Desperate for something normal, I searched for familiar constellations. Orion, the Little Dipper. But the harsh lights above were scattered in no recognizable pattern. I shivered, and not for the cold. Turning my back on the pillar of stones, I headed back toward the house. My path was blocked by a second pile. The brightness of the snow began to blur my vision, and I blinked furiously. All that unbroken snow glowing like the surface of a dim star. Then I noticed something. I rubbed my eyes and looked again, noting the field of flawless white around the pile. No footprints. No marks of any kind. No footprints. Not even the ones I had made on my way out to investigate. They were just gone. Weakness overcame me. My legs gave out and I collapsed in the snow. I couldn't even feel the cold. Above me, the stars seemed to sing that distant ringing hum. At times, it was so deep I thought it would shake me apart. At others, so high it was like a knife through my skull. And though I wanted to escape it, I could not move, as if my body was dead, my mind a prisoner in a husk of an inanimate matter. When the sound finally subsided, I whimpered and pulled myself back to the house. As I shut the door behind me, I chanced to look back on the white field. Half a dozen stone piles looked back at me. The radio static was a welcome, familiar noise after that. I pulled a chair up to the device and sat there, waiting. Waiting for the sun to rise. Waiting for my family to appear. Waiting for an explanation to present itself. Elise, or now, confirming the suspect's identity, the husband, the father, I stared at the radio. Why was it talking about this instead of the storm that must have crippled half the county? Or was the storm more isolated than I thought? Was it just my hilltop farm, buried, cut off from the rest of the world? It was a terrifying thought. No one else knew of the storm, and I had no way of getting out. How long would it be before anyone thought to check on us? How long would our food last, if we could even find our food? Where was my wife? She had to have moved it. It was somewhere else buried under the trackless snow. I'd find her and make her tell me. I started my search anew. Living room, kitchen. In the bedrooms, I tore the blankets off the bed and emptied the closets. No sign of anyone. They couldn't have gone outside because I would have heard the door. I would have seen their footprints in the snow. Just to be sure, I looked out a window. Or those stone piles that appeared, usually a dozen of them, now cluttered the field. It had to be the kids, that was the only explanation. They were covering their tracks somehow, playing some game. The thought of going out once more, beneath those hellish stars, made my skin shrivel, but I was angry now. I stormed outside, went to the nearest pile, and shoved it over. The stones rolled over each other and spread out against the whiteness. I kicked until not one rock remained atop another. Then I threw my head back and shouted their names. They would hear me, whether they were inside or out. My own voice echoed back at me from the distant trees and hills. It seemed to bounce off the sky itself, that awful black sky with its leering stars. The sound made me feel small and adrift. I could just hold the hand of someone, 
some other living thing. I might have an anchor. But alone, those stars seemed like a billion glowing mouths, sucking at the earth, drawing me out of my body and into annihilation. I picked up one of the scattered rocks and hurled it at the stars. An irrational attempt at self-preservation? An experiment? I couldn't say what possessed me to do it, or what I had hoped to accomplish. I only knew that after the stone was lost to my sight, I was afraid. Yes, I'd been frightened before that moment, frightened of the snow and the stars, and everything that was missing. But now, as my missile pierced the empty darkness between me and the heavens, I felt its ripple stir the air, air that needed to be silent and still. It felt like a fly that had only disturbed a single thread, and in so doing, shaken the entire net and called down the spider. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Folks, have you ever had the thought, wow, I didn't know that about myself. Was it a surprise? Did it give you a good feeling? You see, learning new things is a lifelong process, and learning about ourselves is no different. Self-awareness can help us figure out why we react to certain things the way we do, and sometimes gaining that self-awareness isn't easy. Sometimes therapy can help us get a clearer picture of ourselves and our likes, dislikes, and how we can find what we really want out of life. If I may be so bold, if you think your self-awareness could use some guidance, why not try BetterHelp? BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, is here for you and a better outlook on life. It's not just a tool for those who have suffered major trauma in their lives. It's for anyone who may find themselves stuck in life needing just the right push to see their potential and move on to a healthier, more fulfilling life. Sign up is quick, easy, and the online service is there to be convenient and flexible to fit your life's schedule. A quick questionnaire will match you up with a licensed therapist, and you can feel free to switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. Discover your potential at BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash horror today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. I quietly made my way back inside. Barely shut the door when that humming started again. Anticipating it this time, I sank to the floor and began to whimper. My limbs went stiff. I didn't even try to move them this time. Heaviness settled over me, and it became hard to even breathe. I squeezed my eyes shut and waited for that painful noise to end. It went on and on longer than before. The static radio pulled me back. My clothes were soaked with sweat and my mouth was sticky. I must have been lying on the floor for hours, but it was still dark outside. I tried to interpret the voice from the radio as I sat up. In the master bedroom, engaged police in, brief gun family found in the basement. The half understood words sparked a realization. There was one place in the house I hadn't yet searched. We kept the cellar locked so kids wouldn't hurt themselves on the stairs. It was still locked, but after everything else that had happened so far, this possibility didn't seem so strange. The radio's crackling voice followed me as I took a key from its hook in the kitchen and opened the cellar door. Amuel took a stone and said, A put to... Predatory alertness from outside hit me again. Something in the air was angry. I could feel it pressing in against the outside of the house and more strongly rising up from the darkness of the basement. I tried to call my wife's name, but only a sick, high-pitched sound escaped my throat. Pattering footsteps. They drifted up the stairs, spun around the house, up the walls and across the ceiling. Was it footsteps at all or something else? 
I pictured another worldly being hidden behind the veil of night, knocking at the borders of the world in search of an opening. As I shut the cellar door, no longer willing to search the depths for my missing family, a rotten metallic odor wafted into my nostrils. I locked the door and set my weight against it. It wasn't footsteps I'd been hearing, not singing. My family was gone like the cows and the food and the electricity, gone and replaced by clocks that flashed the same time over and over again, malignant stars, piles of stones that rose of their own accord. I was alone with this strangeness, my only company the hissing radio that once more crackled with the ghost of a reporter's voice. Stimit's time of murder at 6.30 turned away from the basement toward the radio, then swallowed hard. On the floor, between me and the kitchen counter, stood a pile of stones. Behold, this stone shall be witness against. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to get to the bottom of everything, and to start, I had to establish some connection to the outside world. No phones, no truck, no power. The only way I could think of was to bundle up and walk the two miles to my nearest neighbor. If they were as cut off as I was, then maybe together I could walk all the way into town. I left the crackling radio behind and layered myself up in as many undergarments as seemed practical before pulling on my boots, coat, hat, and gloves. Then I emerged from the house once more and faced the starlight. I tried not to look at the stones, the pile of stones that stretched beyond sight across the field, I kept my eyes focused in the direction I was heading. I made it to the road and turned east, two miles, snow this deep, probably an hour's walk. One blessing, I thought as I began my trek, was that the same stars that burned my eyes illuminated my path perfectly. As long as I didn't look up, I could pretend it was just a normal, clear winter night. As long as I didn't look to the left or the right, where those pillars of stones rose like silent judges, they lined the road on either side, gathered in random clusters. Six here, three there, another group of three. A pause, then six again. I picked up my pace. The snow resisted me, but I lifted my feet high and bounded down the road. Stones sped by, piles beyond count, Consuming the snow-covered ground, I could hear their voices, groaning, grinding, crackling, like gunshots, wailing like a distant bell. And suddenly I was on my face in the snow, hands clutched over my ears to block out that agonizing hum, the voice of the stars. Beneath it I could hear their screams, but they hadn't had time to scream, so it couldn't be a memory, it had to be real, but it couldn't be because they were and the night was silent again. I rose to my feet and looked around me. The road was filled with stones, left and right, ahead and behind, a labyrinth of rocky pillars in the snow and the overarching alien sky. I looked back the way I'd come, and although I could see the horizon, like a razor blade where snow met space, I couldn't see my farm. Ahead, although the atmosphere was painfully clear, couldn't see my neighbor's house. I should have been able to see one or the other. I was disoriented. Yeah, that, that was all. If I just kept walking, I'd find civilization eventually. I was cold, but not deadly, so my many layers served me well. I wasn't hungry either. It was probably a result of my focus in trying to solve the mystery of the urgency of my mission. Stay calm be an explanation in the end. I brushed off myself and continued walking. Walking, walking, walking. My boots crunched and crunched, and I saw them sink into the snow, but if ever I chanced to look back, I saw no trace of my passage. No footprint or scuff, only more piles and pillars and jumbles of stones, in patterns that I insisted were random even though my brain kept picking out six, three, three. In a sea of random configurations, 
Of course, there would be one or two occurrences of that particular sequence. It wasn't a repeating pattern, just the same pattern. Because although my feet rose and fell and my legs burned from marching through the snow, I wasn't moving. That's right. I was marching in place. I had to be. That's why I left no footprints. And the way the stones seemed to swim past me in a never-ending night was just a hallucination. If I could only make my feet move forward, then I could put that single anomalous pattern behind me and not have to think about it or my empty house or the not-so-empty basement. Stop staring at me! I shouted at the stones, throwing my head skyward as I shouted again. Stop staring! My voice echoed back at me, twisted and deepened in bell-like. The sound of it ground against my ears, ground and ground away, and the pain of it sent me sprawling once more. Not my voice, the voice of the stars, or whatever brilliant thing hid up there, and let its glory show through tiny pinpricks in the black veil, tiny yet still powerful enough to crumble my bones with only a whisper. Make it stop! Make it stop! Make it stop! I reached for the nearest pile and took a stone and bashed it against my ear. Anything to stop the noise, to stop the pain. But the voice was too overpowering. Compared with its vibrations, the impact of rock on skull was nothing. No matter how hard and how insistently I pounded. it, feel nothing, 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 not even when something gave and the rock came away sticky, not even when the snow around me turned pink, the boys faded away and I was left, left staring at the bloody stone in horror, left fingering the uneven jagged terrain of my head, finding the moist border of skin overlaid against something slick and hard. Here a sharp edge, there a massive, something bulbous and soft. And yet I stood, I rose on shaking legs, and looked down at everything I'd spilled, felt the lightness and faint throbbing in my head. I understood and yet didn't. Best not to think about it. I still had my mission, still had to find someone. I turned eastward and continued walking down the road through the maze of stone pillars. I walked for hours, maybe days, and I'm still walking. I don't believe morning is ever coming. I don't believe I'll ever find my neighbor's house or even a break in the landscape, which has become a flat and the eternal sheet of white around me. I keep going because what would I do if I stopped? I'll keep walking until something changes until I forget why I refuse to turn around and go back home. Will I ever forget? I don't think so. And so I'll walk forever, between the stones, under the watching gaze of malevolent stars. I hope you enjoyed Memoriam Eterna by James Colton, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Colton. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Folks, I was going over some copy in the studio the other day, and when doing so, I had a small revelation about my workflow. And afterwards, I thought, wow, I never really thought about doing it that way before. It made me realize something new about myself. And it got me thinking that learning really is a lifelong process, something I believe in. And I'm not just talking about math or science or how to judge the quality of cat videos on YouTube, though I do do that. I'm talking about learning about ourselves in greater depth. Self-awareness can make us think about what we do in our daily lives and whether our reactions are making us move forward or pull back. But maybe we don't know enough about ourselves to see what we can do to make choices which lead to positive outcomes. 
Therapy can sometimes give us that recognition, that spark, to see the parts of us that we don't understand come to life and solve our problems. If you find yourself not quite knowing what to do next, I recommend giving the good folks at BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp, that's help, H-E-L-P, as in the famous Beatles song, and it'll give you the flexible, convenient support you need to get you on track to unlocking the tools you need for better self-awareness. Just fill out a short questionnaire and you'll be paired up with a licensed therapist who can fit your schedule. And if you need to switch therapists, you can do so at any time for no charge. It's online, affordable care that you can get to get you to a better place. And remember, you don't need to be suffering from major trauma in your life. Even the best of us can use a little support from time to time to reach the goals we really want. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash horror today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Colton. Beyond other fantastic works that can be found in print and on his website, I'd like to remind you that you can find a wonderfully chilling tale by Mr. Colton in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Anthology, Volume 1, now available in print and in digital ebook, with audiobook coming soon. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave him a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that me, Otis Jiry, sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. I'd like to say he finally found a way off that road, got into town, and got the help he so desperately needed. I'd also like to say that Sisyphus finally got that damn boulder to stay up, but something tells me you wouldn't believe me about that either. But something most of us can agree upon? Young love? Yes, it warms the very heart when two people find each other and everything seems to be perfect. But the issue is a bit different. Something seems to be, well, stepping in the way between them. Maybe it's a clingy attitude or a strong personality. Or maybe, just maybe, it's something that just isn't expected. Without further ado, I present to you, Meant to Be. True love. Soulmates. Meant to be. I don't believe in any of it. Fate is more complicated than that. We always have a choice. It's just that sometimes, a lot of the time, taking control is more difficult than it's worth. Am I really happy way, the way things are? No, not entirely. Could I have fought this destiny? Perhaps, but with no guarantee that things would have turned out any better. Certainly, they could have turned out worse. It's easier this way, safer for everyone. It's not what most people would call lucky in love. I've only been in two serious relationships, and they both, well, you'll see. The first was Erica Tift, high school. That first romance, first for both of us, felt like a fairy tale, and in our teenage naivety, we treated it like we made silly promises, sealed them with trinkets. The one I remember best was a piece of paper inscribed with every vow you could think of. Each of us signed it, then Erica ripped it in half and folded two little origami hearts, one for each of us. We kept them with us at all times, safeguards against whatever unseen dragons lurked in our future, lying in wait to separate us. Not that we really thought anything would become between us. Our love was meant to be. If you 
ever I was a fatalist, it was back then, when the ideas of destiny and soulmates rang so romantic. We were clueless. We didn't know that the dragons of real life can't be warded off by childish rituals. And I know now that sometimes predestination, if you want to call it that, doesn't mean a happy ending. That night, as I waited for her outside the movie theater, even as she ran across the parking lot to meet me with that enchanting grin of hers, I had no idea. Everyone afterward insisted that I couldn't have changed anything, that I wasn't in control. They were wrong. I could have picked a different time for our date, a different movie, a different day. For weeks afterward, my mind spun itself dizzy with all the ways I could have orchestrated things so that Erica wasn't standing on that patch of blacktop when that pickup truck went roaring too fast across the parking lot. Erica was buried with her little origami heart clasped in her hands. I carried mine in my pocket always. I thought I'd never love again, swore it even. At the funeral, when I saw her face for the last time, I whispered to her that promise. But I was a foolish teenager. That vow was a last, desperate attempt to keep the fairy tale alive. I grew up graduated from high school, got a summer job. By the time I started my first semester of college, I'd accepted it. The dragon had gotten us. The fairy tale was dead. I still kept my paper heart in my pocket, but that was more out of habit than sentimentality. Then, in the fall semester of my sophomore year, I met Stephanie Kelsey. I won't pretend that I felt ready for a new relationship, Honestly, if it had been left up to me, I probably never would have even noticed her. You could say our meeting was beyond my control, and I could say that I could have registered for a different general psych class and attended a different college. In the end, it doesn't really matter. She sat next to me that morning, introduced herself, whispered funny comments about the professor throughout the lecture. When the class was over, she said it was nice meeting me and looked forward to seeing me tomorrow. Turned out she didn't have to wait that long, though. She found me again during lunch. Didn't even ask if the seat across from me was taken. It wasn't. She just sat right down and started talking. Asked what my schedule was like. Wondered if we had any other classes together. Turned out there were a few. I think it was during that meal that I first began to wake up. First time since high school that I'd actually stopped and noticed a pretty face. Of course, putting a time stamp on it quelled my brief excitement. High school. The movie theater parking lot. Thankfully, or so I thought at the time, Stephanie was persistent. She sat next to me in every class we shared, joined me at every meal, engaged me in conversation. After a couple of weeks, I realized I looked forward to it. Found myself smiling back at her whenever she walked through a door, waving at her across campus. Then, one afternoon, as I settled in for a pre-calculus class that we didn't share, someone sat next to me. I didn't really notice at first. I was too busy digging through my book bag. But I noticed the smell. It startled me, not because it was unpleasant, but because it was wrong for this room for this time of day. I knew this smell, but not in this context. I finally looked up, and there was Stephanie, grinning at me expectantly. After laughing at my shock, she explained how she'd managed to reorganize her schedule so she could transfer into my pre-calc class. That she would do that, go through the effort. The feeling that had first stirred weeks ago in general psych now woke fully. This time, memories of high school didn't break through my euphoria until I was back in my dorm room that night. Even then, they lacked power. I realized that at some point during the past several years, my grief had faded and been replaced with a more general loneliness. I hadn't noticed because the emotions were so similar. I'd gone from being filled with pain to being filled with nothing, and now Stephanie wanted to fill that emptiness to make me whole again. 
The remainder of fall semester was great. I had fun, more than I thought possible. Winter break drew near, and it came time to register for spring classes. Stephanie and I planned everything carefully and managed to end up with identical schedules. We were ecstatic. We'd be together all day, every day. We went our separate ways over break. Although I was excited to see my family again, I found myself counting down the days until Stephanie and I would be reunited. A month had never seemed so long to me as it did during the drive home from college. Being back in my hometown brought back memories, of course. It seemed a quieter place than I remembered, emptier. Driving by my old high school was a shock. The building didn't look any different on the outside. The bricks seemed to be stacked too tightly, like fingers locked together, grinding each other to the bone in their attempt to hold something in. Something glimpsed through the dark shadows of the windows. My first night home, I couldn't sleep. I lay in my bed, still in my jeans, unable to shake the images from my head. Familiar houses and storefronts, all watching for my return. Their blackened windows turning curious expressions at whatever changes they might notice in me. Even my own bedroom, the closet, the dresser, the air vents. All the places that held darkness within. My phone buzzed, and although I could see her face, hear her voice, I'd never been so delighted to hear from Stephanie. Just got home, her text read. Miss you already. The same here, I replied. She then proceeded to tell me all about her drive, about her parents, asked me if I had any plans for the next several weeks. Nothing in particular, I said. Well, if you decide to see a movie, tell me first so I can watch it too. Then we can talk about it afterward. I hesitated. I hadn't been to a theater since... I'm probably not going to see a movie. Oh. We chatted for a while after that, then we said goodnight. But my mind was still stuck in the track that Stephanie had inadvertently set it in. Almost without realizing it, I put my hand in my jeans pocket and felt around for the item that had always been there, force of habit. That little piece of folded paper, the heart from another age. Why did I still hold on to it? The absurdity of it. I had a new girlfriend. I'd moved on. This trinket was nothing but childhood foolishness. A reminder of darker times, just like the rest of this town. It belonged here, buried in the dirt, left to decay until nothing was left. I walked over to my trash can and held out the paper heart. But my hand froze there. I couldn't make my fingers let go. It was too dismissive, too disrespectful. As painful as it was, my past had formed me. I couldn't control what had happened. It wasn't a choice I could erase just by throwing out a silly love note. But I couldn't hang on to it either. It was wrong, unfair to Stephanie. I stood there for several minutes, painful minutes. The darkness of my bedroom crushing me. Then I moved to the window, opened it, threw the heart into the air. The December wind snatched it and sent it spinning out of sight, lost in the snow. Seeing it go like that, it felt right, respectful. I shut the window and buried myself in my bed sheets and finally fell asleep. I checked my phone the next morning and was met with a wall of texts from Stephanie. Are you there? Please answer. Are you? Please? They'd been sent sporadically through the night. I pondered them while I showered. What was she doing up so late? After breakfast, I called her. She answered, perky as ever, saying she was just about to call me when her phone rang. She asked me a few questions. Did my parents have the Christmas tree up for me when I got home? Yes. Did I dream about her last night? No, surprisingly. What was I going to do the rest of the day? Yeah, I'm not sure yet. We finally said goodbye when she said she had to go to Christmas shopping with her mother. The next day was similar. We said goodnight to each other. I fell asleep. 
I woke up the next morning to find several new text messages. Did the girl never sleep? The pattern continued throughout break. One night, so many texts came in all at once that the buzzing of my phone woke me up. I read them, but they were all similar. Hello, where are, are you? Answer, please. I sent a quick reply. What are you doing up? Can't rest, only. I'll call you in the morning, I wrote. Promise. Love you, Steph. I put my phone away and crawled back under the covers. I heard the phone buzz once more, but it was too tired to check on it. Soon I was asleep, and then it was morning. When I picked up my phone, there were more messages. Who? Answer. Answer now, please. Where are... I called Stephanie. Morning, she said. I've been waiting all night for your call. Well, I hope you slept a little. It was hard, but I managed. So you're all right, then? Yeah. Okay. After our usual chat, we hung up and went about our separate days. Or at least I tried to. Stephanie texted me a lot more often than usual. What are you doing? Who with? Answered her every time, hanging out at the house, with my parents, eating dinner getting ready to bed, going to bed, going to sleep. Good night. But it kept going. Constant. One day, toward the end of break, I called Stephanie and asked what was going on. She said she missed me, couldn't wait for the break to be over, to get back to college so we could be together again. I asked if she could lay off the texts a bit. She sent me a little sad face in response. She did text me less. However, less is a relative term. The messages were still too numerous, and eventually I just turned my phone off. Break was almost over, and I, I couldn't wait. Couldn't wait for the texts and phone calls to stop. Couldn't wait to not have every moment of my day asked after. Once we were together again, she could chill out. In hindsight, I should have recognized the warning signs, the sequence of events, the triggers. I moved back into my dorm in mid-January. The next day, Stephanie joined me in the cafeteria for breakfast. She grinned at me and I almost flinched. That grin, that wild grin. Somehow I never noticed how huge it was, how much of her gums had revealed. She crushed me in a hug I thought would never end. Like I said, we had identical schedules that semester. For breakfast, we went from class to class to lunch to class, never leaving each other's side. At first, it was all right. As I'd hoped, she stopped blowing up my phone. But then we parted ways for the night. As I was brushing my teeth, the text, Where are you? In my dorm, I replied. What doing? Getting ready for bed. Promise? That was a head-scratcher. Yes, I promise that's what I'm doing. You promise? Yes, I promise. Love me? I do. The next morning, before our first class started, Stephanie sat next to me and asked, What were you doing last night? I rolled my eyes. Nothing. She clearly wanted to say more, but then the professor showed up, and the lecture started. By the time class was over, Stephanie seemed to have forgotten about it. By the second week, back from break, I was starting to wonder what I'd gotten myself into. I'd thought that seeing me on a daily basis would stem Stephanie's incessant communications. But nothing changed, and I didn't know what more I could do. I was already spending every free moment I had with her, and in person she seemed fine, perky as ever. But it seemed the more effort I put into our relationship, the worse the texts got. Finally, one night in early February, I snapped. When the first text came in, I wrote back, This needs to stop. I need some privacy. And my phone was quiet the rest of the night. The next day, Stephanie met me, not with her usual grin, which I'd come to loathe, but with a subdued, What was that text about? 
I took a deep breath before answering. We're together constantly. I need a break now and then. A break? From what? From me? It's like I said last night. I need privacy, some alone time. Um, a break. Stephanie looked at me for a while. I looked back as long as I could. Her eyes. I don't know how I could have failed to notice before just how huge they were. I guess at first I found her wide gaze alluring, but now they seemed like they were about to roll out of her skull. Fine, she said at last. We walked together in silence to her class, and then, as I sat down in the usual spot, she kept going across to the far side of the lecture hall. Stephanie didn't join me for lunch, and she didn't sit by me in any of our classes for the rest of the day. I felt a bit guilty, but I couldn't deny the sense of relief. I said goodnight to her at the end of the day, and, still feeling a little guilty, tried to give her a hug. She barely responded, and then she was gone back to her dorm. I know, looking back, that there had to have been more to her story. For some reason she got so attached so quickly, some past hurt that made my rejection, as I'm sure she felt it, so much worse. Even back then, as I watched her walk away that night, I felt some inkling. In an attempt to smooth things over, I sent her a text. I love you, Stephanie. I know she saw it. I watched her pause and look at her phone. I made such a mistake. Those who would comfort me would say I couldn't control the outcome. You're certainly right about that. I also could have chosen not to send that text, or I could have chosen to just endure her possessive behavior, or I could have chosen to never entertain her advances from the very beginning. Where exactly is the line between free will and destiny? Are they even separate concepts or just different names for the same thing? A text came in while I slept, from Stephanie, of course. Between us. What between us? Who between? Love me. Promise. You promise? I didn't see Stephanie the next day. I tried calling her, but got no answer. The day after, same story. Then a campus security officer came to my dorm and asked me a bunch of questions. Where and when did I last see her? Was she acting strange? Any clues she may have let slip. Time can pass surprisingly quickly during a crisis. When you're distracted, worried. You think tomorrow will never come, then suddenly it's the day after and still no word. And you wonder how she could have been gone so long already. The Friday after Stephanie vanished, as I was sitting in my dorm room, I got a text. I fix what between us. I tried texting her back, tried calling, no response. I had the presence of mind to report the communication to campus security. The officer I spoke with said they couldn't do much for the info, but they'd pass it on to the police. He also said it was a good sign, and she was still alive. He told me to let them know if she reached out again. A few nights later, she did. I find you, come for you. I wrote back, I'll be waiting, come quickly. Everyone's worried about you. To my surprise, she responded, dragon between us, fixed. Something in my chest turned cold. What was she talking about? I asked for clarification, but she offered none. I waited up all night, waited for another text or a knock on the door or something. The next morning, I once again reported that to campus security. I didn't go to class that day. I was too exhausted from my all-night vigil. I closed the blinds on the dorm room window and buried my head beneath the covers. Dozed off. It doesn't take much to confuse the mind, to make something mundane and familiar seem strange. For instance, waking up and thinking you know what time it is, and looking at your clock and realizing it's already mid-afternoon. You're so used to the normal human pattern of sleeping at night and 
waking in the morning that the light bleeding through your window blinds must be artificial. For a moment, you wonder if you're still dreaming. In such a manner, I woke, confused, lost, like I'd been jolted mid-journey and fallen off the train that ferried the rest of humanity safely through dreamlands. Now I was stuck in some limbo. It was obviously silent in my room, save for the irregular metallic thump of the radiator in the hall. That lone sound only underscored the emptiness. I was alone, the sole human awake in this no-man's region of consciousness. I wanted to open the blinds to look out and confirm to myself that there was more to existence than my tiny dorm room and that the rest of the world still spun. But between me and the window stood my desk, and on my desk sat an object, a small, white object, a familiar object, although I refused to accept its presence. I took a staggering step forward and felt my throat constrict. I tried to swallow. Couldn't. Couldn't be. It couldn't be there. Every worn angle and frayed crease exactly as I remembered it. A little origami heart. As I stood in silent denial, my phone buzzed. I reached for it without looking, couldn't tear my eyes from that folded piece of paper until my phone was right in front of my eyes. A text message from Stephanie's number. Why threw away? Our love must renew. Promise? trembling fingers I take back. Where's Stephanie? Dragon between us, gone. What did you do to her, I asked. Meet me. My fingers were shaking so badly I couldn't type anymore. The air seemed thin. All light seemed sucked away, consumed by the phone in my hand. Intensified and blasted into my eyes so the screen and its words were all I could see. Even if I were to close my eyes, I believe I would still read them burning through my eyelids. I finally brought my shaking under control enough to respond. Where? No answer. Collapsed on my bed and stayed there for at least an hour. This had to be a bad dream. The result of an overanxious mind deprived of sleep. I couldn't go to campus security for this, could I? What would I tell them? I looked back at my desk, half expecting the heart to be gone. A memory of a dream of a memory. But it was still there. Just sitting there, inanimate. Glowing in the dim, diffused light from the window. So many conflicting emotions. I wanted to rip it to pieces, burn it. I wanted to slip it back in my pocket. I wanted to leave it there on the desk forever and pretend it didn't exist. I ended up sweeping it into one of the desk drawers. Even that brief contact was a shock. The paper made soft through time and wear. The sensation I knew so well, I thought I'd never feel again. And then the drawer was shut and I kept it like that. Refused to open it for anything. Couldn't stand the thought of seeing it again. I returned to class the next day and tried to put the incident out of my mind. I tried to go back to the relatively mundane worry I was supposed to feel about my missing girlfriend. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't make myself hope that they'd find Stephanie. I knew they wouldn't. She was gone. And I, I accepted that. My heart still grieved. My brain told me I was sad. But it wasn't like in high school. A third part of me, the subconscious, something deeper than subconscious except in it. Over the next several days, I saw hearts everywhere. I told myself it was only because Valentine's Day was close. Certainly, there were the expected decorations. Red, glitzy hearts trimmed in lace, hanging in every other window. But these weren't what I noticed. Instead, it was the little white heart left unceremoniously on a dusty windowsill, a priest corner of paper that may have been anything or maybe nothing, discarded in a trash can. I never opened that drawer in my desk in my dorm room. 
I want to confirm the dread that was slowly filling me. Over those several days, I didn't receive any more texts from Stephanie's phone. Not until Valentine's Day itself. Not until I returned to my room that night. The first thing I noticed when I walked in was that the drawer, that drawer, was open. The second thing, things, I should say, were the two pieces of torn paper laid side by side atop my desk. They were both creased into oblivion, and the writing on them was faint, smudged, barely legible. But I recognized them. Of course I did. I remembered writing them in an era of fairy tales. They rested next to each other, torn edges touching, forming a complete whole for the first time since their creation. One was relatively crystal, kept safe through the years, of being hidden away in my pocket. The other was mottled with dirt or something similar. There was one thing new, something that bound the reunited pieces in strokes and swoops of rust-colored ink. A name. Erica Tift. As I read that impossible signature, my phone buzzed. Promise. And from behind me, I heard another sound. A click and a breath and a rattle that made me think of soda sucked through a straw or some other type of fluid forced through some other kind of tube. And I started to turn but remembered a pickup truck in a movie theater and blacktop made wet by sudden violence. My natural barrier split open and I stopped myself from looking. Instead, I stared down at that name written in an awkward hand, those red letters drying brown. If I signed my name below Erica's, would that be the end? Would she leave me alone or would it only solidify her hold on me? I thought of Stephanie, the girl for whom I'd thrown away my heart, of what had become of her. If I didn't sign, what then? How many others would meet the same fate? Something touched my hand, something cold and hard like twigs in winter, placed themselves between my fingers. I pulled my hand away from the sharp pain with a gasp. My index finger was bleeding. Promise? rattled a voice in my ear, and I was bathed in the smell of damp earth and iron. I didn't have a choice, or if I did, the alternative was too difficult. That place where fate and freedom intersect. I lowered my bleeding finger to the paper and wrote my name, tracing over the faded shadow of my signature from years before, renewing it, strengthening it. As I finished, an icy sensation wrapped around my wrist. A gentle weight settled on my shoulder. A rattling sigh, the scent of blood, that familiar voice from my childhood whispering, I love. I whipped around to face the room. The pressure lifted, the cold vanished. The smell evaporated. I saw nothing but my empty dorm. I heard nothing but my own pulse. I turned back to the desk on shaking legs. One origami heart lay there. I picked it up, thought about unfolding it to check, to confirm. But instead, I slipped it into my pocket. I've held onto it ever since. I'm too afraid to do anything else. Because sometimes, when I think I'm alone in my apartment, I feel something cold brush against my back. On nights when I can't sleep, I feel the mattress sinking beside me. No one would call me lucky, but I am loved, and she'll never leave me. Perhaps that's what makes her my true love, after all. Perhaps we really were meant to be. I hope you enjoyed Meant to Be by James Colton, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Colton. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash C-O-L-T-O-N. A reminder, his thoroughly chilling works can be found not only through his website, but also in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Anthology, Volume 1, to be exact. Available 
for your enjoyment in print, digital print, and soon in glorious audio. As a reminder, if you decide to give tonight's talented author's stories a read, please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program and that Otis sent you. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2023, why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for your phone bill? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton, with phone plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. What is it that makes the other companies' plans so expensive anyway? Is it their need to deliver talk, text, and data reliably? Well, Mint Mobile's plans all include unlimited talk and text, and their high-speed data comes on the nation's largest 5G network. So it can't be that. Maybe it's because they have all those nearly empty store spaces with a few phones and screen covers to keep open, where somebody transfers all your data for you. Well, I think that's where Mint Mobile has them beat. Since their online-only model delivers plans right to your door, and with eSIM, you can swap out to your new service in mere minutes. Plus, and this is my favorite part, you don't even have to lose your current phone to do it. With all of these advantages and plans starting at such low prices, maybe you can finally free up some money for the more important things in life, like groceries, gas, or for those of you in winter weather, a shovel or two to make a path to your front door. And there's nothing more I enjoy than making sure you have peace of mind. Except, of course, when I'm not scaring you out of sleep. So, folks, I think it's time you and I start saving more money where we can with Mint Mobile. You get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash dark. That's mintmobile.com slash dark. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dark. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure he would very much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, Featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. You get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest episodes and updates, new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well, at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment 
and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>